there was a time where I wouldn't have pe- stuff like that on my show. Uh, anything weird, anything strange, I wouldn't have it. Funny enough, it was a scientist, Dr. Bendernagel, God rest his soul. Uh, I thought the world of him still hold him in high regard, still think the world of him. Uh, and I remember he told me one time, you're being very disingenuous. Uh, but he was right. And he would always do this thing, and I do it on the show. I ask it more in a sincere way. Uh, his way of asking it to me was to break my balls. He would go, oh, well, you have it all figured out then. Why don't you go ahead and explain to me what Sasquatch is? And it's like I couldn't, I didn't have an answer. I didn't, you know. So if you don't, but his point was, if you don't know, maybe stop and listen. And maybe do some actual investigation. Uh, take the time to hear people out because you will find patterns. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you, you know, a lot of people, they'll go to the BFRO website to look up their county. You know, if there's been sightings where they've seen it or whatever. Why is it on the BFRO website we don't see those weird reports? We don't see the, the lights. Even a lot of the aggressive reports you won't find on the BFRO website. What, why is that? They take it out, pure and simple. It's it's very frustrating for me. Uh, it's like he wants to be something to everybody. And so the reports are sanitized, censored, whatever you want to call it. And key data is taken out if they, he, whoever it is, is thinking you're getting too close to the woo factor, the paranormal, you know, they're not, you know, they are flesh and blood, but that probably is not all they are. They may have some skill sets that we just don't understand or don't believe they have. And anything that gets anywhere close to that is just taken out. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is KC Shaw, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be chatting with Carter Bouchard. He's the author of Sasquatch Evidence of an Enigma. And if you go to relichominid.com, you can get a copy of his book. I've just started reading it. I'm fascinated by it. And Carter is a BFRO investigator. He's taken many reports, talked to a lot of different eyewitnesses, and he started finding very strange patterns. So he'll be talking about uh, kind of how he got into this and then some of these different reports and some of the weird patterns he found. A few things that I, I never picked up on, 
especially his theory on their counting and some of the wood knocking that goes on. Some of the weird things you hear people talk about and you sit back and you wonder, I wonder why they do that. Uh, and it's all theories, of course, but um, I really can't wait to talk to Carter. And we'll wrap up the show talking to Greg Walter. Uh, Greg is the author of The Ridge Walkers, and Greg actually started uh, writing this book about his family history, uh, but he had a Sasquatch encounter. He kind of had this near de- near-death experience, decided to go out in the woods and had this weird encounter with a Sasquatch. So he included it in the book. Uh, it's called The Ridge Walkers. Uh, if you get a chance to get yourself a copy of it, I'll include links to as well for that. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Carter to the show. Carter, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it, Wes. I'm always glad to chat and talk Bigfoot stuff and, you know, other weird stuff. But uh, Bigfoot's my meat and potatoes. I'm just consumed with it. It's, It's a disease. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a little bit. Uh, I really it is. tell me a little bit about the book. What made you write the book? If someone were to pick it up, what would they expect to read from the book? Well, uh, what made me uh, write the book was, uh, you know, it's just, I've, I've I've been investigating for about eleven years with BFRO. I've had uh, eighty five reports published to be a far off. So I've, that's, that's a good chunk. Uh, and uh, I've spoken with about 200 plus witnesses over the years. And uh, I started seeing patterns after a while. You just start, you know, they're telling you things. They're telling you that this fantastic story, this event that happened to them. And then after they're through telling you that they will go, Oh, now here's something you're not going to believe. You know, they want to add on to an already fantastic encounter where they've had, you know, an eye-to-eye visual encounter, some of them are night. But there was patterns uh, regarding other sort of esoteric, abstract concepts that most people just don't think they have. And when you start hearing the same things over and over and over, uh, over and above what they're main report was they throw it in just like well i hope you don't laugh at me but and so i started hearing a pattern about uh speech and language and cloaking things of that nature where you just go "Ah, you know i don't know but after a while i started seeing that there was a, a regular routine of hearing this stuff so most researchers investigators discard that. If it's not a meat and potatoes, flesh and blood, ape in the woods story, uh, a lot of them won't go there. They just won't go there. And I chose to go there because we're not getting answers with our normal method of research. So we have to start considering some other things. And that's kind of what what made me write the book was I was just hearing things from people I was looking in the eye. I believed them. I met them. I talked to them. And even those I didn't meet, you know, there's there's just a level of sincerity and uh, no BS on the other end of the phone that I'm going, this man, this woman, they're they're freaked out and they're telling me the truth. You know, you don't, you don't spill your guts to a perfect stranger and then almost find yourself on the verge of tears. Who does that to a perfect stranger? You know? So there's a level of sincerity there with all the kind of weird, uh, paranormal type things, if you want to call it that. So that's what made me write the book. And then other things that had happened to me where I see patterns and other things, you know, I don't want to see patterns. I just, do they just present themselves and you if you're just being open-minded you can't ignore some of the things that you're coming up with just can't do it so that's kind of a uh, that's a long-winded answer but there you have it no it wasn't long-winded at all and i appreciate your honesty on it you know and i started finding patterns myself uh, you know, you talk to eyewitnesses, especially on people's property, and they would say they would tell you about some encounter or different weird things going on and around their property, and then they would say, "Oh, and by the way, I'm also seeing these weird lights," and I, and I always would bypass the lights and just go straight to the encounter. 
But then you start looking back and you're like, well, wait a minute, you know, and then you start hearing that over and over and over again. And again, I'm not saying Sasquatch come out of a ball of light. I'm not saying Sasquatch. It's a weird coincidence that po- it's like Dr. Bender Nuggle used to tell me it's a weird coincidence you have to address because you'll find patterns kind of like what you're finding, Carter. So when people read Sasquatch Evidence of Enigma, is there accounts in the book that people can actually read? Oh, yeah. I put in there, um, I think there's, uh, gosh, 13 chapters. I have uh, one chapter that's got, at the time I wrote the book, my favorite reports that I've had published. Since I wrote the book, I've had some even better ones, but there's some pretty good ones in there. I have uh, my habituation and visitation uh, witnesses uh, and I do differentiate between visitation and habituation. Uh, it's just a slight difference, but it, it, it creates an entirely different, uh, you know, set of events. Uh, and I've got uh, a chapter called Knock Knock, where um, I am theorizing and f- putting forth the uh, concept that they can count and they do count on occasion. The structures as language, I think the structures. They are talking to us and about us right to our faces. We don't know what they're saying because the structure is complex. It's not just five branches leaning up against a tree, but the very complex weaving and ornate structures that take a lot of time to put together. That's a language, you know, just like we have a, a stop sign or a circle with a red red line across. It means don't go. That's prohibited. Well, that. That tells you something. When you look at those structures, they should be telling us something. And I'm kind of putting a little bit together, but it's still it's very complex because you know their language is not it's not English. So you have to you have to just pick and choose. But I prefer to go out on a limb and take a chance with concepts rather than say nothing because you know you have to speak up. So. If if you you should have some basic knowledge or interest in Sasquatch, when you pick up the book, it does kind of start from a very you know pedestrian average, and then it just picks up with more and more information, a little bit more uh, you know complex uh, theories as I go. I discuss quantum physics, what little I do know about it, but that is a possibility too. When you start talking about clothes, uh, cloaking and interdimensional and uh, mind speak and stuff like that. You know, uh, I can hear people rolling their eyes right now, but you know, as a rule, we have to consider almost anything unless we know everything and we don't. So you're just not being a good investigator or a researcher. If you don't at least consider the stuff, you don't have to believe it, but you should at least consider it And then you start seeing patterns and you will be a more thorough investigator and you'll be paying more attention when you're out in the woods. So, yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. There was a time where I wouldn't have stuff like that on my show. Uh, Anything weird, anything strange, I wouldn't have it. Funny enough, it was a scientist, Dr. Bennernagel, God rest his soul. Uh, I thought the world of him still hold him in high regard, still think the world of him. And I remember he told me one time, you're being very disingenuous, Uh, but he was right. And he would always do this thing, and I do it on the show. I ask it more in a sincere way. Uh, His way of asking it to me was to break my balls. He would go, oh, well, you have it all figured out then. Why don't you go ahead and explain to me what Sasquatch is? Since you're unwilling to hear any of this other stuff, go ahead and tell me what Sasquatch is, Wes. And it's like I couldn't, I didn't have an answer. I didn't, you know... So if you don't, but his point was, if you don't know, maybe stop and listen and maybe do some actual investigation. Uh, Take the time to hear people out because you will find patterns. Uh, One of the things I want to ask you, you know, a lot of people, they'll go to the BFRO website to look up their county. You know, if there's been sightings where they've seen it or whatever, why is it on the BFRO website? We don't see those weird reports. We don't see the, the lights. Even a lot of the aggressive reports you won't find on the BFRO website. Why, why is that? They take it out, pure and simple. It's, it's very frustrating for me. Uh, it's like he wants to be something to everybody. 
And so the reports are sanitized, censored, whatever you want to call it, and key data is taken out if they, he, whoever it is, is thinking you're getting too close to the woo factor, the paranormal. You know, they're not, you know, they are flesh and blood, but that probably is not all they are. They may have some skill sets that we just don't understand or don't believe they have. And anything that gets anywhere close to that is just taken out. It's very, very frustrating for me as an investigator because let the people decide. You know, what you take out. Now, there are some crazy off-the-wall stuff. Yeah, there's hoaxers and jokesters and people that are just looking for attention and they're hallucinating or whatever. We have all these categories for stuff that doesn't fit the paradigm that they want to project. But they take it out because they don't want people to go, okay, that's crazy. I'm not, let's go somewhere else. We're, we're deceiving the public. And, you know, and my problem with it is is that when you take that stuff out, Bob and Mary, who are sitting in their home, who just had the daylight scared out of scared out of them with a eye to eye encounter and some other stuff with orbs or what have you, they want to hear a report that's like theirs, so they will come forward. And if people aren't hearing other people having the same experiences, they're not going to come forward. We're losing a lot of information just from fear of ridicule. And it's very, it's very, very frustrating. I mean, I I can't even begin to tell you how frustrating it is, you know. Well, you're not the only one. I I remember many uh, investigators for the BFRO that told me this years ago. And at one point, I actually had access to their database, and I was amazed how many reports weren't published. That's a different topic. But um, one of the things that a lot of the investigators told me was, if there's lights or anything odd or anything strange, they remove it or they sanitize it. They'll change what the actual report was. And again, I'm not, I'm not doing this for like Jerry Springer, you know, yeah. let's, let's bash the BFRO. That's not my point. My point is they sanitize it. And I think a lot of these old time Bigfoot researchers, whatever they call themselves, do the same thing. If there's anything weird, strange or whatever, they take it out, and I think it's very disingenuous. If you're looking yeah. for answers, you're not going to do that. If you've already got it figured out, if you've already had the answers, then what's the point in even talking to eyewitnesses if you already know what we're searching for? And I'm so glad to have you be frustrated by that. It shows character. shows that you have integrity. You know what I mean? Yeah, I appreciate that. And it it is – it's just – it's lying to the public, you know, uh, it, it, it's it, BFRO to some degree is kind of becoming the uh, CNN of the Sasquatch uh, world because it's all fake news. It's, you know, other than the very pedestrian road crossing, highway crossing, saw one across the creek while I'm fishing. Uh, if there's anything in there that is past that, you know, uh, voices, uh, uh, cloaking, lights, orbs, uh, anything of that nature, it's gone. It's just out of there, you know, and it, it's not right. You know, put a disclaimer on there. This report does not necessarily reflect the belief of BFRO. We just thought we'd present it for the public to read and hear, you know, but they don't do that. They won't do that. And, uh, it's a, it's a source of irritation and frustration, you know. Can you speculate why? Why? Why do you think it it goes that way? You you, you know I, I, I've toyed with that, and I really you know I, I think he wants to be just so meat and potatoes and generic, and it, it's like he's running for office or something. I want to say the right thing. I want to kiss all the babies. I want to say all the right things and be all the things that everybody wants it to be. And I don't want to go outside because no one will listen to it. Well, I think you totally missing the boat because people will listen to it because there is stuff going on. I'm not saying they're, you know, like you mentioned, they're not, you know, flying a UFO down from Venus and dropping off and getting a couple of cheeseburgers and flying back to Venus. I mean, there's not that kind of stuff and that kind of stuff never will see the light of day. And I mostly agree with it, but you know, you, you, 
you can tell when someone's yanking your chain. So if you don't get the impression they're yanking their chain, uh, they're either sadly mistaken or they had an incredible event that just doesn't fit the paradigm. Well, we got to expound the. We have to expand the boundaries because we don't know. If we don't know, why are we taking things out just because it doesn't fit our narrow point of view? It just, it, it's frustrating. So I just think they're trying to be everything to everybody because you know things aren't like they used to be a few years ago when the show was going go full guns and all that stuff. So that's just a theory. I have no idea what the motivation is. Uh, uh, I don't get any commu- communication back from them when I uh, send emails in other, other than my reports. Uh, there's just no communication anymore. Well, let me ask you this. I'm really curious. How did you become an investigator? I mean, obviously, you go out to these sites, you're talking to people. Uh, tell me about Carter prior to becoming an investigator. What what kind of led up to you actually uh, investigating these re- different reports? Well, it, my interest, like many people, you probably heard this uh, 1,500 times, in search of with Leonard Nimoy. You know, that caught everybody's attention and you know, the Patterson Gimlin film was on there along with other oddities, you know, UFOs and ghosts and, you know, uh, uh, urban legend monsters all over the world, that kind of stuff. But that's what got me into it. And I had a, uh, I had a, 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 a UFO event when I was about eight or nine, which just suddenly told me that there's so much more to the world than is being told or admitted to. I just, you just something you know, either it comes at some point in your life, you know, you get a, a tap on the shoulder. And uh, I just realized, you know, when I <laughs> sent away a box tops uh, uh, off of cereal boxes to get my first map of the universe, and I put it on my wall and it was all the planets, but there's no stars. I go, where's all the stars? I look up in the sky and see all the stars. I mean, it's kind of a, a, a stupid analogy, but that's what uh, that started a questioning in my mind. So uh, then, you know, I, after I got out of high school and stuff, I kind of went by the wayside. I was a musician for a lot of years, 15, 20 years. And so I never lost interest, but I just wasn't delving into it. But uh, I became an investigator about 12 years ago. Uh, my wife and I went to Washington uh, State just to get away. Uh, had had a slight event, but I found a uh, remember the geocache. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I found a, an ammo box strapped to the base of a tree under some brush because I had to go relieve myself, and there was this box right there where I was taking a shot. And so I thought I stumbled upon a drug dealer's stash or something because it was one of those big army ammo boxes. Anyway, I opened it and there was all these notebooks in there and little, little gadgets and trinkets. And you sign your name, you take something out, you put something in and you sign your name and say, I was here and you close it back up. Well, the name right before me was an investigator uh, from Missouri. And I don't even remember his name now to save my life. I said, you know, that's the ticket. I want to go on an expedition. So what you do to become an expedition, uh, get on an expedition and become an investigator is you go on an expedition, tell them you're very, very interested. And you got to kind of show them you got the snap. You know, you recognize footprints. You recognize different kinds of wildlife and tracks and stuff and and the structures. And you've got enough snap to be aware of your surroundings and point it out and remember it. And eventually they recommended me for an investigator. And here I am, you know. Yeah, I hear you. Tell tell me about the UFO encounter. So you're eight or nine years old. What kind of what were you doing, and and what did you see? What happened? Well, it's kind of a roundabout story. I do not remember. Do you ever have a story you tell, like you did some really stupid stuff when you were a kid, and you you should have got killed or really badly injured, and it it didn't happen. You know, you you didn't. You walked away from whatever it was. You did something stupid, like you know, jumped off the roof uh, onto a bush. You know, you, everybody has a story they tell. Yeah. Well, I had a uh, my friend uh, Craig Whaley and I. We hung around all the time, and we got new bikes. And we were racing through my neighborhood one summer day, and uh, we ran the stop sign because it's, you know, broad daylight in the middle of the work day, and nobody was out there. And I was in, in Texas at the time, and we ran a stop sign. Well, this car flew by, and it just barely missed us. I mean, we, we should have both been run over, and I always told that story. I did some stupid stuff when I was a kid, and I always tell that story about, you know, just being a carefree kid and running a stop sign and almost getting run over. Well, 
my wife and I and my former uh, comedy partner, uh, his widow and her new husband, we went somewhere. And this is like 15 years ago, 16 years ago. We went to see uh, do a past life regression. So we went through a, a hypnotist and she had a maze and you walk through the maze and get calm and centered and relaxed. And then you go into her uh, big barn that had been converted into a, a, a studio and she regressed us all one by one. So she hypnotizes me. I start crying, just crying and talking like a little eight year old kid. And I relive this experience of an abduction. And I have no, like, as I'm talking to you right now, I know nothing more than what I was told. I, I've been under four times. I've told the same story four different times. Uh, two of them with Dolores Cannon, if I don't even know who, if you know who she is. She's a very well-known regression hypnotist. She's passed away about five years ago. Uh, but I was taken aboard a craft with Craig. And actually, he was the person they were after. And I was just collateral damage because I was with him. And according to her, I was taken two other times because I related two other stories. I have no memory as I'm talking to you now. I should remember that stuff, but I have no memory of it. But when you take me under, that's what comes out from that event that I remember. And the car that raced in front of us wasn't a car. It was a UFO. Oh, is this the weirdest thing? And I was going... I can't be making this up. I don't even remember this, you know, and I've tried to find Craig and he, I think he's long past. I can't find him on Facebook or anywhere. I think he's gone, uh, passed away, but it was just the weirdest thing. And I could hear him. I could hear him screaming. Like they were doing things to him. I could see, you know, you, you've probably heard this a, a few times, you know, if, if you listen to any regression or abduction stuff, you kind of have a thin screen or a veil and you can see the shadows and, and stuff, but you don't really have a clear view of what's going on. But I could hear him screaming and I was just laying there listening to it. It was just the weirdest thing. But that told me, along with my fake poster of the universe that there was something else in the world in the universe going on other things and i should start being keenly aware of things around me because they may not be as they seem and the bigfoot sasquatch thing just took me by storm uh once i you know retired from the music business and I, i've been doing this for like say 12 12 13 years bfro for about 11 years i think so that was a long answer yeah, no, I appreciate the answer. It's uh, I interviewed uh, Travis Walton. I'm sure you've seen the movie Fire in the Sky. Oh, yeah, um, excellent. And I sat across the table from him. I mean, I've I've had dinner with Travis, and we've hung out and everything. But uh, that guy's not lying. Something happened to that guy. If you don't believe in aliens, you don't believe in abduction, you'll walk away after talking to him and go, something happened to this guy. You know, it's it's just so profound when you when you speak to him. Let me ask you, when when was the first uh, investigation that you did where you went out and you thought to yourself, this person's not lying, something's going on here? Well, I'm trying to think. It was, uh, I've had so many. Uh, I had a sighting of my own. All, my, all three of my sightings have been at night through thermal. I've not had the pleasure of a daytime face-to-face -face encounter or even a visual sighting from far away. I, it's all been at night. But uh, it was one of my habituation witnesses uh, that um, I went out and I – they do this. They've been having creatures on their property for at least 15 years, maybe 20. And the what they do about once a week, or if I ever want to go visit them, which I do, they you know, sit on the front porch. And oh, probably about 25, 30 yards across the road, across the front yard, across the road, and into some woods on the other side, they're just interacting with Sasquatches, mostly at night. They sit there, and when my people get there and sit on the porch, if they're in the neighborhood, you will hear the Squatches walking up heavy, bipedal, crunchy, through the forest. Then they sit down, and they throw rocks and pebbles and do little howls and, you know, snap twigs and just back and forth. It's like a, they're having a, a relationship, a conversation. I've had several of my whoops, uh, returned. I mean, it just, and that told me right there that 
you know, they they were telling me these things, and I believed them already because they're very virtuous people. They're they're devout Christians for one thing. They're just not uh, BSers, you know. You just know you're talking to a sincere person. But when I got there and started just playfully whoop, and then I hear one, it, it comes right back. It sounds almost identical what I to what I did. I'm going, oh my god! And they do this all the time. And so that told me right then that I can no longer put stuff on the back burner when someone's telling me something. You know, no matter how yeah. outlandish it might be, it's not that outlandish. If you think of the world we're living in now, we've got a Hubble telescope. We've got a little go-kart running around Mars taking photos and sending it back for millions of miles. And we can't figure out what Sasquatch are. And I know that somebody already knows darn good and well what they are. So, you know, I mean, it, it's all just a facade in, in, you, in your perception. So that's what got me seriously paying attention and going back and talking to a few of my witnesses and going back and reading the reports I had published and the ones I didn't have published and just looking at the data and say, what am I missing? What's the deal? And then you'd find it. You'd find little snippets here and there. And uh, here I am. And there's the book. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much it. No, and I know. started reading the book and I was, I was fascinated by it. I'm going to finish reading it. Tell me about your encounter. So you were, it was thermal. Was it during an expedition or... What were you doing when you saw this thing on thermal? What did, what did you actually see? Well, the first time it was uh, probably eight or nine years ago, Christmas time. It was down South Missouri. Uh, Mark Twain National Forest is a haven for these guys. I mean, it's it's you know it's a huge, huge. I mean, you know, a good chunk of the state is Mark Twain National Forest. It, the the terrain and habitat is just perfect, but. Uh, uh, we went to a spot where a local mayor had made a report, and he asked not to be identified. He didn't even want the report to go public, but he had to tell somebody. So we were just walking through the woods, me and several other investigators. It was like 16 degrees. It was chipper, very chipper, about 11 o'clock at night. And we saw some movement, and so I had a flare. I had one of those handheld flares, which lights up and just – blows in your face. So, I mean, your, your face is all lit up. There's nothing clandestine about it, but there was two, there was one standing up and one kneeling down watching this. And I, I could see them and I snapped a few photos uh, that didn't take video that unit. And they just stood there and watched us. They're about eh, 150 feet away, maybe 200 feet up a hill, across the railroad track, across the Creek. Uh, but they were watching and they were moving, you know, one night they'd be there one minute, one minute they'd be there one minute they wouldn't be. Uh, but those are just some photos. And that was my first, but the one that really was astounding was my, me and my partner and, uh, a woman had gone out and her husband had to go back home to take care of a kid. So it was just me and him and her. And we'd gone to a place on the current river down in Missouri and, uh, I picked that place because I have had two class A reports from the same guy and he has interactions and that's a whole nother story. I think the Squatch know who he is. He knows it's the same ones. It, that's a long involved deal, but you know, I, I think they know him and they show themselves to him for a variety of reasons. But anyway, we were sitting on a, a rock bar in the middle of the current river. Now my partner, Brian was across the river on the other side, and I'm talking about 30, 40 feet. The river had narrowed at that point because it had to go under a bridge uh, where we were parked. And so myself and uh, Cynthia were sitting on the rock bar out in kind of in the middle of the, the river, but a foot deep at, at the most. It wasn't that deep. And he was on the other side uh, on the bank. And he kept saying, I, I'm seeing like this dark, blob, this dark force or a bush or something's kind of making its way toward me. And I, he didn't have any thermal gear. So, and I said, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. And I had my thermal and I had been recording. I turned it off to save my battery. And I don't know how many times you've heard that. And I've said it and I'm never going to say it again. I'm just going to waste batteries until I, I go broke because I'm not going to ever not be recording again. But anyway, um, he said, it's getting close and I'm getting a little freaked out. He wanted to move. I said, don't move, don't move. And we had a radio on, but they were turned way down. So any, uh, anyway, he goes, I I've got to get up. I got to move. And so 
I looked over and Cynthia was sitting next to me, but about 10 feet away. And I saw this glow behind her. So she was close enough that she was obscuring the creature that was there. It looked like a, she had a halo is what it looked like. All I saw was the top of the creature blocked by her head. And so when I stood up, my feet went out from under me and I shoveled the rocks and they made you know a big noise. The creature looked at me and it had not seen us. It was walking toward Brian. It had not even seen us because we were on his peripheral vision and we were just sitting real quiet. So it just, it just didn't see us. So there is hope for all investigators. If you think a Sasquatch isn't going to walk in front of a trail cam, this one might, because he was dumb enough not to be looking around. And so he was walking. When I stood up, I saw him and he was probably no more than five feet, but he was humongous. He was like a bowling ball with big arms and legs. I mean, the heat signature was solid white and he was probably 25 or 30 feet away. He looked at Brian. He looked back to where he come from. He looked back to Brian. He looked back to where he come from and turned around and walked back into the woods behind us. You could hear him. And it took one, two, three, four to five seconds tops. And it just blew my mind. You know, you, you hear guys when they're, you know, startled or upset in the woods, you can hear the breathing, you know, the, and you get cotton mouth, you get dry mouth and you, oh my God, oh my God. It was, it was awesome. And it was just like right there. And it just didn't see us. He was so focused on looking at Brian and Brian told me later that he had, uh, my car was parked across the road and that my dash cam was still rolling. So there was a light coming from my dash cam Well, he swore that he saw something walk in front of my car and blocked out the dash cam for just a second. And then it came back on. And then he thinks it went across the highway, walked into the woods, which was behind us. And then came through the woods, uh, heading toward him. Uh, and so it was, it was, inc- it was incredible. And it was, it was just real as it could be. And, you know, if I only thought I had imagined this, that, and the other here and there, that was all washed from my memory because it was indelible. It was awesome. Uh, yeah. It's exciting and terrifying at the same time, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I was, uh, my adrenaline was going, you know, and I, I was uh, thirstier than I should have been because <laughs> I was, <sighs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I couldn't, it, it happened so fast. I didn't even think, and I've heard this so many times, and now I'm one of the dummies that can't put your finger on the record button, but I was just so enthralled with what I was watching. I just go, this is incredible. Oh, my God. You know, but I don't think it was the full grown one. It was not it was not that big. It was, I'd say, five, five and a half feet tops, but it was I'd never seen one or even seen images of one that fat and rotund. It was just, it it was an odd shape, but it was big, fat, roly poly Sasquatch. You know, it it was had the built like a linebacker, but it was, you know, kind of a barrel, kind of a yeah, circle. Yeah, Yeah, it was barrel, barrel chested and barrel bellied and everything. It, It was just funny. And I was watching it when it was looking back to Brian, then back into the woods. He was trying to see which way he needed to go to get the heck out of there. Uh, I had full frontal view, except for the dark spots on his face where the eye sockets were. You know, so I, I could see him turning his body and look at that massive chest and the build. But he was he was a fat little fart. I mean, he was you know he wouldn't. <laughs> He'd uh, been sitting at the bar eating beer and pizza for too long. Uh, you know, I'm sure as they you know got got bigger and older, they uh, stretch out. But it was it was a, a shape I wasn't anticipating seeing when I thought I'd see Sasquatch. I thought it would be the big eight foot tall, built like a linebacker. You know, shoulders are four feet wide and it goes down to a 32 inch waist, that kind of thing. But you know, this one was built uh, contrary to the standard you know view of a lot of people. It was quite exhilarating. That was 2016. Wow, so pretty recent. I mean, really, not too long ago. Yeah. L- let yeah. me ask you, what? so you talk about visitation, you talk about habituation. What's the difference, and, I mean, how do you explain one over the other? I know it sounds like a very basic question, but uh, for the audience, how does one become an habituator, 
and how does one just get visitations on a regular basis? Yeah, well, visitation is more like they're on the property. You know it. They know you know it. But you're not doing anything to encourage it. You're not doing anything to discourage it. You just kind of let them come and go because you're quite happy with the relationship just like it is. You may not want them to get any closer. You know, people uh, you know, aren't really educated about the Sasquatch thing, and but they're still fascinated with the fact that they're there. But they got kids and pets, and they just, you know, they just choose to have that. Habituation uh, is where you are encouraging, you're gifting you're gifting food, you're gifting rocks and feathers or uh, you know, mirrors or marbles or anything, and you're getting gifted back. That's habituation. You want them to come closer. You're offering them food, which they take, and they will bring you back. You know, sometimes they bring you back a dead rabbit or a dead mouse or a rat or, you know, a, a, a turtle shell. They'll bring you back something that's in somewhat the same format that you gave to them, but you're, you're encouraging it. And that's what these people I was talking about that sit on their front porch. Um, they want that, they want that interaction, you know, and they live in total isolation. So there's nobody on that property. There's no way that's anything other than Sasquatch. I mean, it's just, you can hear the, heavy bipedal walking, you know what you're listening to. You've been out in the, you know, you know, when you hear one, you know, the, the, the yeah. foot crunch. So, but that, that's the difference for me. That's how I differentiate between the visitation. They come, they go, you don't encourage, you don't run them off. You don't, you know, shoot a gun in the air or go, Hey, get out of here. Start screaming, yelling, throwing stuff. You just go, Oh, there they are. That was cool. That was fascinating. I okay. I've had, enough. I've had enough. I'm going back in and do the laundry. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me ask you, why are they so hard to get on video? I mean, you have the, these habituators, and why are they, why is it so hard for them? Uh, you know, if I had them running around my property, I was feeding them pancakes, I was feeding them different things. You'd think these people would have evidence. Why is it so hard for these people to pre present evidence that they have these things on their property? I mean, any ideas, any theories on that? Well, one I just gave you with me staring at a Sasquatch and I couldn't hit the record button because you're so you're so in shock. You know, you just go, oh, wow, oh, yeah. oh, boom, 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 and it's over. But I think they put the cameras out. They'll have their phone in their hand, but they realize they've had their cameras out forever and ever and ever, and they get nothing, and they know they're on the property. I do have a few photos that they have sent me that are uh, – very much in the realm of a Sasquatch. I'm not saying I've got a face or anything, but I've got uh, I've got body parts and things that are, and they're not blur. They're not uh, you know blob squatches. They're not blob arms or they're they're clear daylight trail cams. But I, I think the creatures know what they are and they avoid them. And people that live on the property they understand well. They're avoiding my trail cam. If I raise this camera, this iPhone up to my face, as I'm doing that, they're going to be gone. Or they could take a photo, take a video, and they may have some missing time. They may be able to do something with, you know, infrasound, which creates some missing time or just a, a little a skip in the, you know, fabric of time, and they're gone. So it, it's possible. I think people just... Number one, you're not ready for it when it happens. And then when you are ready, uh, just like a hunter putting a, his gun up to his face and looking through his sight, and he's got one in his scope, he can't pull the trigger because he knows it's human, and they're looking right at him. Uh, let me ask you, have you ever had someone come to you and say, Carter, listen, I got these things on my property. I've had these encounters. They go through everything with you. And, th and then at the end of this, the conversation, they say, how do I get rid of them? I don't want them here anymore. Have you ever had a witness come forward and, and kind of talk to you in that manner? Yeah, yeah. I, I tell them, just put up a couple of trail cams. They'll disappear. I mean, <laughs> they won't go anywhere near a trail cam. So if you want them, uh, you know, uh, if you're on you know private property and you're isolated, uh, you know fire a couple of shots in the air. You know uh, when you see them, uh, make a lot of noise and just not make it friendly. Uh, but you want to you know put trail cams out in front of your house, put them in the woods where you know they frequent by your deer stand or your feeders or whatever. They won't come anywhere near it. 
you know, because they don't want any part of that. They're willing to share themselves with these people with certain conditions, unspoken conditions. Don't put up a trail cam or don't stand there with, you know, $5,000, you know, video camera waiting for me to pop out behind the bushes because I'm not going to do it anymore. You know, it's on their terms. It's not your terms. It's their terms. They are very curious about humans, especially women and children. They want to learn because just like you or I look at them, we they look at us and go, well, it sort of looks like me, but not. You know, what, what three or four percent DNA separate us from apes and gorillas and, you know, cows and pigs and, you know, different parts of DNA. So they know we are similar, but yet we're different. I, I just know they know that. I know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm forcing a human trait on a yeah. unproven creature. But you know what I mean? I mean, if, you know, I went to the, I took my granddaughter to the zoo the other day. And we went to the gorilla house and this gorilla was, he looked so miserable and he was looking at all the people banging on the window and, you know, Hey, look at me. The look on his face was like, I can't say it, but you know what I mean? The look on his face, like you stupid humans, what are you doing? You know, I think they know that we are them and they are us give or take. Yeah, uh, a, miss, a missing link and some DNA. I mean, you know, that's really oversimplifying it, but you know, so it, it's on their terms. So if you want to enjoy them, and when I first went to my habituation place, I just I didn't bring anything with me. I mean, I had it in the car, but I didn't take it out. I just sat there on the porch and enjoyed the show. I didn't want to introduce gear. But if you if you have creatures on your property, put up cameras. Keep all the food and stuff away. When you see them, you know, yell and scream, get out of here. Just make it – they'll know that they're not wanted. You know, they just won't come around. There's no use in that because, you know, they'll move on to something else. Yeah. And it a, usually works. It usually works. People just, you know – and sometimes you just quit paying attention to them, you know. Uh, remove the things they're taking. The, the, I had one uh, people that, that they're still a uh, – they're more like a visitation – uh, the squatchers were reaching through a doggy door and pulling a 50 pound bag of food through the doggy door and just taking the bag off. They're just carting the bag off. You'd find the bag, you know, a couple of days later out in the middle of the pasture somewhere empty, you know, well, who's going to do pull that through a doggy door in the middle of the night? Well, it's, a, a, so they remove some of the, uh, temptations of coming around, uh, stuff like that. But, you know, uh, trail cams, security cameras, a lot of bright lights, uh, that takes care of a whole lot of it. And, and why know? do you, and why do you think that is? I'm asking your own, I, obviously you don't know. I don't know. I'm just asking your own theory. Why, why do you think that that, and I do agree with you. I think the moment you start putting up, lighting up the place, trail cams everywhere. Uh, I've talked to many eyewitnesses to where that generally gets them to back off. Not always, but I would say a higher percentage of the time it works. Why, why yeah. do you, why do you think that is? Well, uh, I think their uh, their key is their stealth and their covertness. And if you light up the night, they can't just walk up to your house and you know see and do what they want to do. They can't peek in your windows. They can't walk over and grab a chicken. You know, I mean, you've got lights everywhere. You have motion activated lights. As soon as they walk around, you, you hear it all the time. I turn on the light, they turn around away. Well, if the light comes on automatic, they're gone. Uh, they 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 survive on stealth and covertness. They, they, they own the night. You know, we have, us humans are totally outmatched for the night. So if you light the place up, uh, get sounds, gunfire, uh, anything to make a, a pest of yourself instead of in a welcoming environment, you don't have to do it a lot. I think they get the picture fairly quickly and they'll just move on. Yeah, and I tend to agree with you. I think that's a great point. I really hope people get the book, Sasquatch Evidence of Enigma. And again, it's uh, relichominid.com. I'll throw up links. I'm enjoying it. I started reading the book. I'm really enjoying the book a lot. Uh, Thank you. I, I think it's very open um, to a lot of things a lot of these quote-unquote research experts aren't open to. Um, and you have kind of opened the door on a lot of this. Tell me about, um, is there one witness that kind of stands out to you or an encounter that kind of stands out to you? might be weird. It might have been aggressive, 
but one that really, really sticks out to you? The one that sticks out is really a, a there's two, but one is a, a class B and it was down in uh, Arkansas. I'm trying to remember the town, uh, a very devout Christian family. They lived, uh, they worked at uh, a chicken processing plant. The, the husband did. And part of his employment package was a free cabin. They got a free house and a small salary. So they had, they had no rent. They had a, they had a big family. I think they had seven kids. And so he went to work and left mom at home with all the kids. They had the kids being watched. They could see them, but more or less silhouettes and shadows during the day, but they were peeking around trees, multiple creatures. And they did this almost any time they were outside. There were large squatches and big squatches, but they were just silhouettes deep in the woods. You could see them because there's daylight and you could see them moving around, but it was just a silhouette, but you knew it was a humanoid shape and it was big. And they watched the kids because they had six, seven kids uh, that were out playing in the yard all the time. They had a couple of older kids who were kind of, you know, helping mom watch them. And then they'd have people come over and they'd bring their kids over and they'd play. They had, you know, 12, 15 kids running around the yard all day. And it, the squatches loved that. They were watching them, but they, the kids would, you know, be playing with a ball or they're just running into the woods and they'd come screaming out, mommy, 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 there's a monster. There's a big ape. There's a gorilla. There is a giant Kong in the woods. This, this looks like my Kong bear and you know all this stuff. And they were banging on the house at night because of the uh, and they're watching the kids through their bedroom window and they were watching the TV they were standing there watching the TV the kids told them this stuff you know eventually they said well you know the big monkey was watching TV they were watching TV with us well they started banging on the house because the kids got freaked out so the parents turned the TV off and had all the kids go sleep in the living room so the squatters were banging on the house at night because they wanted their TV they wanted to watch the kids watching TV. That was like a regular event. And they had uh, uh, a couple of peacocks killed. They had uh, chickens disappear. Uh, they had the toys and farm tools that were out in the backyard and they would find them out in the woods. Uh, you know, the next day they're trying to, where's the wheelbarrow? You know, where's the, where's the uh, garden cart? Where's this and that? Where's my tools? Where's my rake? They'd find them out in the woods. These creatures were coming up there taking their stuff and play with them like toys and taking them out in the woods and play with them. Then they would just leave them there. They were banging on the water pipes. They were opening the door to the watershed uh, where the pump was and banging on the pipes to see if anybody was paying attention. And they kept thinking there was something wrong with their water pump. And they go out there and something had left the door open. Well, it's clearly been latched and they opened it and left it open. So all this stuff went on for about six or seven years until they, they couldn't take it anymore and they left. But it's it's like they never saw it, but they heard it. They saw the silhouettes, and they endured it, and they finally just had enough and had to leave. But that went on for like three or four years. It was incredible. I yeah. mean, uh, I'd have to. I'll, I'll find it. I'll I'll email you the PDF. It's an incredible report because it it's one of the, it's very riveting, and there's not an eye to eye encounter. There's nothing. You know, of, a, of a sighting. It's strictly uh, anecdotal stuff going on in the woods around them, but it's 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 mind boggling. You know, that's one of my favorite reports is, is a class B because all this was going on and the kids were seeing it and freaked out. And the, the squash got mad because the parents took the TV out of the kids room and put it in the uh, living room. Which happens a lot. You hear of these same reports over and over again where I can't tell you, man, I witnesses I've talked to where they go, you know, I thought my place was haunted. And then they start telling me why they think it's haunted because of the banging on the house, something running on the roof, rocks being thrown, but they never actually see what, what, what's doing it. So they, they, mm -hmm. a lot of eyewitnesses have told me, I used to think this place was haunted till I started listening to your show. And it was like, oh, some of this is making sense. On, on yeah. what's going on. You mentioned a second report. What what was the second one? Well, the second one, there, there's two by one fellow, and uh, it's uh, down in South Missouri. And uh, he and his uncle and his son uh, hunt the same spot 
year after year after year. It's a family tradition. And they fish the same area, the same creek, the same river, uh, which is not necessarily in that same area. Uh, but one night, uh, they had uh, they'd killed a deer, and they'd uh, killed a hog, and they'd hung them up, let them bleed out, gutting them out, and getting the gut piles out and everything, and putting them over there in the bush. And well, they were sitting there by the fire, and they could see them walking around. They could see their silhouettes. And they started banging on the side of the camper. They wanted it at that gut pile. They wanted it at that deer and the hog that were strung up in the tree. And they were slapping the tree. They were slapping sticks. They were throwing rocks. And they were just walking around in circles trying to get them to run off. So they did get spooked. And they ran into their camper and hid in there. And that's where their weapons were. They didn't have their guns out. They had them in the camper. Uh, and this was, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And they could hear them out there uh, rustling around at the gut pile. And my witness uh, said, you're not taking my food because he feeds his family. They hunt to feed their family and not, they don't thrill hunt or trophy hunt. They strictly feed their family. So he went out and they had their guns with them and they were just screaming and yelling. They didn't take a shot, but they screamed and yelled at them and they finally went away. Uh, that happened to him a second time. And then uh, the first time it was a report and I made it, I made the report and it got published. The, the second report, he was sitting in a blind and this was probably about two or three miles from this location. And he swears up and down. It was the same one of the same Sasquatches. He was in a blind 20 feet up. This was walking around a pond and he saw it. It looked up at him and he looked at it and it's like they knew each other. You know, it just, and he looked at him and said, it was like he, the look on the Squatch's face was what? You going to shoot me? And uh, he had his bow at that time. He had a bow with him and they just looked at each other. And the creature walked off, just turned his head, walked off, didn't run, wasn't afraid of him. He just walked off. And he knows that was one of the ones that was there trying to get their uh, kill. And we talked about it. And he's a very, he's also a very religious guy. There's a lot of, you know, very <laughs> deeply religious people down the, in the South Missouri in the, in the woods. Um, and he had been fishing and he's had the squats come up to him and try to steal the fish off his uh, uh, stringers, off his trot lines. And it's the same number. It's three of them the same time. And he just knows. And from the look of the other one, he thinks they know him and they don't harass him nearly like they would other people because they know he is a, a lover of the forest. He is only hunting to feed his family. He doesn't kill and, you know, throw fish on the bank. I don't want that one. If he doesn't want him. He puts him back in. He he just has the sense that they're watching and they know what he's doing. Can't put my finger on it. I can't tell you that you know. Uh, there's any one thing that tells me other than he's just one of these very down home, sincere people. He's a he's a minister. He goes to small country churches and he's like a substitute minister. And so he goes to these churches where a minister or pastor is left, and so he takes over that church until they find a replacement. So that's that's what he does for the church, and so. I think he just knows that and feels that, you know, and, uh, yeah, I've had you report. He just knows that these are the same ones. Cause he always sees three. It's like, you know, mama, papa, baby, or mama, papa, and uncle or something. He sees three each time they're out. It's just kind of bizarre, you know? Yeah. I think it down and, South, you fi definitely find the salt of the earth type people, um, did he ever describe, did the face, I mean, did he go into details? Did it look more human? Did it look more yeah. like an ape? Did it look very more human, very human. He, he, the, 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 they got two good looks at him. One, uh, by campfire light that night when they were kind of circling the camp, uh, you know, fire kind of flared up one night and he looked right at it. It was like shining a flashlight in his face. It was just, it looked like the planet of the apes type. I mean, it was more human than ape, you know, it had, you know, that look of intelligence. It had a human face. The one that he saw when he was up in the blind, he said, that was a human. It, uh, what he told me was, Carter, I think that was a human. 
I mean, that, that was, that's how he talks. And he was just like, when he told me that, he said, it just looked like a man. It, it, it wasn't nothing else. And I'm going, dang, you know, that's it. And how many hunters have you heard, uh, Wes, that have told you I'm looking at it right through my scope and I couldn't pull the trigger? Many. You know? Very many. Yeah, a yeah. lot. Yeah, and, and so that's it. You know, an ape. A gorilla is an ape or a gorilla or a chimp or a orang pendek or orangutan or whatever. And uh, the Sasquatch is neither. It is, you know, it looks human, but it's built like an ape. I don't know what else to say genetically, but it's, you know, and you hear that enough. That's a pattern. There's lots of patterns, you know. You can't discount patterns. You just, you can, but you got to. Study them and assemble them first before you toss them. You know, if you just you think, well, that's bull, that's baloney. I'm not gonna no. I don't, put it in your pipe and smoke it, and see if you like it. If not, discard it. But as a researcher, scientists, whatever, you can't discard something just because it doesn't fit your paradigm. You know, where would we be if that was the way everybody thought? Well, that can't be. It's got to be something else. You know, I mean, it, you just can't. So th- there's patterns in everything, and there's a lot of patterns in the things that are discarded by people that call themselves researchers, you know. so yeah, I would agree a lot. What do you think that they are, Carter? What do you think that uh, Sasquatch is? If someone were to came, uh, come to you and say, Carter, what do you think Sasquatch is? What, what would you say to them? Obviously, there's no wrong answer because no one really knows. Yeah, no I'm, one really knows. Yeah, uh, I'm in the, the camp of... Uh, a human hybrid, uh, an ape hybrid. Uh, if you just take some of the meat and potatoes tails of you know, possibly Gigantopithecus uh, mated with a, a human female, uh, and you come up with a Sasquatch, uh, you know, uh, the DNA studies that are being quashed left and right are uh, human female unknown male hominid is kind of what you get. So the women mated somewhere along the line, Native Americans or way back in the Neanderthal or whenever that all started. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I think there was some, you know, Saturday night fever going on and uh, they made it, <laughs> you know, unless they were put here like that already. And we just happened to be two arms, two legs and a head. I'm not sure. You know, I think I think we got tweaked along the way, and maybe they were the precursors of humans. And suddenly, I don't know, but I, I think they're an ape-human hybrid, or a hominid-human hybrid, or something along there. there there's, it, I, I hate to say missing link, but you know, they are a flesh and blood creature. Uh, that we just don't understand. We're we're missing something. I think we, a lot of the things we should know are being withheld from us. Um, but you know, if it looks like an ape, cracks like an ape, it might be a Sasquatch. You know, it's, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, but somewhere along the line, I think you know there was a, some human interaction, some human, uh, uh, you know, Jacantopithecus or whatever other form uh, uh, mating going on, and we got what we got. We don't know what else to call it right now because nobody's telling us, you know, and somebody knows, you know, I know, I mean, you know, know, I I know that people know what's going on. We just aren't privileged enough to, to know it. Yeah, it's no doubt. It's no doubt. There's so much more I want to go into. Uh, Would you come back for a part two on the show? I would love to have you back. Yeah, I'd love to come back because I could be talking for uh, what time. I can't even see what time it is. Is it eight o'clock already or six o'clock? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I haven't even cracked anything. No, I'd love to come back. You know, I'd, I'd love to come back. And we have to do a couple of one hour shots. You know, we could take a chapter because there's some things in the book, you know, about uh, them counting. I, I'm, I'm convinced that there are occasions where they feel the need to count humans and they do. And, you know, and I've had multiple people with me when I brought it up and they're going, oh, my God. I mean, it's a theory. I can't yeah, prove yeah, it. yeah, give give us your theory real quick. I'm going to have you back for a part two, but give us your theory real quick on the wood knocks. Okay, well, on the wood knocks, uh, my best sample was I had a group of six people I took out. It was an expedition, uh, and we were sitting by a fire, and we were kept hearing knocks, you know, and uh, rock splashes in this pond. We were at this pond, and we kept hearing these really big. They were they weren't fish jumping, but they were 
big rocks being thrown or splashing being done by somebody. Well, there was a woman who wouldn't shut up. She just kept talking. She kept wanting to take selfies and check her Facebook on her phone and kept opening the car and shining lights on us. I was going, I God dang it. You know? So I walked away and when I walked away about halfway to where I was going, there was a bam, 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 bam. That's me leaving a group of six. And so I got where I wanted to get away from the noise and the firelight. I called my partner, Brian. I said, hey, Brian, why don't you come over here? It's nice and quiet, and uh, you can, we can see some things, and it might just be another perspective. So he leaves. Bam, 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 bam. Bam, bam. Different cadence. There's four people left. There's two people left the group. And that's when the bulb went on for me because the same thing happened in reverse when we went back. We both went back together, bam, 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 bam. The six people are all back together. I can't put it any more simply than that, you know, and it's happened multiple times. I don't think they do it all the time, but I think when there is a need to make others aware that there's humans in the area and two of them have left the group and they're wandering into the woods, uh, you need to know about this. So that's a concept. And I've got better examples and, you know, uh, with 11 knocks and anyway, that's just the tip of it. But that's if you listen, sometimes if you're out in the woods and you're in a group and a couple of people leave and you're being followed or watched, they may knock to others to let others know that, hey, these two guys left and OK, now they're all back together. It just. Yeah, it's a. It's a I didn't mean to cut you off. I remember when you you told me that the other day, a light bulb kind of went off uh, because I can pull a couple shows you can listen to, and there's three of them, and they hear three wood knocks, or there's two of them, and they hear two wood knocks, or there's one of them, and I never really thought about that before. I always thought it was their weird way of communicating back and forth to each other, but I never really put the piece of the puzzle together. I, I realize it's theory. We're theorizing here. But I never yeah. really put that piece of the puzzle together that they're counting how many people are there. And I can pull yeah. up a couple shows that you'll be shocked by. Yeah. I've got a better example uh, of a, one of my reports that was sanitized and the very clincher was taken out. Uh, and uh, we don't have time now, but uh, I'll tell you about it sometime. But it uh, it was it was riveting and it was proof. And uh, the, the clincher was taken right out of the report. And it was just, it, it was, it was just darn insulting, you know, and it, it was lying to people and taking something out that might make you think, you know, make the public think and go, you know, that kind of happened to us. Little things like that. But I have a, I have a report. I'll, I'll send you the report. Uh, I'll send you both versions. The one that I printed before uh, I turned it in, and the one that was sent and published to the public with the key element left out. You'll see it. You won't even it. it you'll you'll figure it out. But uh, I'll email it to you. It's pretty pretty impressive. Yeah, you know? please. Yeah, please do. Please do. Yeah. And I'll definitely have you back for a part two. There's so much more I want to go into. Uh, I hope okay. people go out there get the book Sasquatch Evidence of an Enigma. Uh, .com. I'll throw up links. I'm starting to read the book. I'm really enjoying the book a lot. And I recommend cool. the audience go out and uh, get yourself a copy. Uh, Carter, yeah. th thanks so much for coming on. I'm going to have you back for a part two, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. All right, Wes. Well, we'll be chatting uh, between now and then. I'll send you some stuff and uh, send me your links on the report. Uh, I wanted to see that Foo Fighter thing I, that just disappeared. So send me your favors and I want to look at them again. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Enjoy it, sir. We will talk to you. Well, I want to welcome to the show uh, Greg Walter. Uh, Greg, thanks for coming on. Glad to be here and glad to be on the show today. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. I'm glad to have you. And I know you have your website, theridgewalkers.com. And uh, you wrote a book, The Ridge Walkers, uh, When Legend Becomes an Encounter. Greg, tell me about the book. What, what kind of got you into writing this book? 
I started this as a project to tell my family story going back about 100 years. Uh, my family has a very rich history in America. It dates back to about the 1640s. Um, there was even some involvement in the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War and then also into the American Revolution. One of our family members got a 200-acre land grant from the state of New York for his involvement with what was called then the Green Mountain Boys of New Hampshire. Um, they were like early special forces, and so it was a series of conflicts all around kind of the fur trade. But, but anyways, panning ahead, I wanted to tell the story of my grandfather, and that was in the, the early part of the, ninth, of the 20th century and his involvement in two world wars and then a nationalist uprising in China. And then his son, my uncle, would go on um, – as a 17 year old into the Korean theater. And then from there, uh, he would get washed out of the service by the end of the 1950s. And, um, but his friend went on into, um, this was his best friend he met in jump school. And he went on into special forces into Vietnam. And he's the one we have the letters, the photographs, the maps, the locations of these camps, you know, in the jungles and stuff. And so, um, so that was, that was my, my original intent to take this all the way through the sixties into the whole, um, the free speech movement or the anti-war movement and free speech movement into the, into the, um, the Vietnam protest movement. And then from there into the back to the land movement. And so, and it's that back to the land movement that would create the environmental awareness and so forth like this in a lot of our areas in the greater Pacific Northwest. And so that was, that was my original plan was to tell the story sort of going back forward. And then from there, I realized, well, wait a minute, I've got this component of the Sasquatch. Why not get that out there now? Because it's a popular topic, you know, in this day and age, uh, it seems like it's drawn a lot of interest. So I decided to, um, to tell my story first. Tell us about it. So you, you had an encounter? Yeah. So it's, it's based on an encounter. Um, it's a story of a man's life. Um, I kind of, you know, I wrote this, basically it's about my life, you know, when I took, I took some liberties and took some embellishments, that's what's fun about fiction. And so it's something that, um, that I decided to do that, but it was, but it was loosely based on an encounter that I had, uh, back in the mid 1990s, um, on a ridgeline system in Southern Oregon. I was at the time going through a transition. I had just, um, I had just suffered a, um, well, it was a, a near death experience on a fishing boat in Alaska. And in the course of that also, we were, um, that was involved with a friend. This was on the Oregon coast and we were doing, it was about a 20 to 25 year search for treasure. At any rate, while all that was happening, you know, we, we weren't finding the treasure. We were running into problems. I was breaking up with my girlfriend. I was on this fishing boat you know, that almost capsized. And so I decided to go on this journey. So I, so I take off on this trip. It was a, it was going to be an eight night, nine day trip. I got out to a place where there was a divide that split off. It was a big, big divide of, you know, mountains and some small tarns and stuff like this out, out in this, out in this location. So it's kind of a place where you've got like a North South Ridge running into an East West Ridge. And so that's where I decided to camp. Um, as I was camping there, as I laid out my stuff, I was about to throw some water over my head and I looked down and see a footprint and um, it, a bare footprint, a big bare foot, a big bare footprint. <laughs> and, um, and so that was rather interesting. Um, and it took me back for a second. So I did take a photograph of it. The thing that was so interesting with it was that there was smeared prints all like right near where I camped. And, um, and I couldn't make out, you know, an actual footprint in that because it looked like there was a scuffle, a, a, a fight or something had happened there. And, um, and by the way, on this trip, as I'm walking out there and, you know, so forth like this, I'm seeing a lot of bear sign. I mean, there's bears everywhere up there. And so, you know, to run across a bear at night, I mean, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> Basically, that's like saying that you didn't keep a clean camp. <laughs> um, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but, but you know, so you want to avoid that as much as you can. You know, if you're going to have a sighting of something crazy, you know, the last thing you need is a bear chewing up your favorite bag of Cheetos. Um, you know, so, so yeah, keep a clean camp. Thank you. Um, but, but at any rate, um, 
so so the sun was going down the moon was coming up but the moon was behind a ridge i was in like an amphitheater area maybe about half the size of a football field and this thing literally i'm sitting there near where there was like an old campfire you know that somebody had burned in past years um but i'm sitting there on a log and all of a sudden i hear this movement from within the amphitheater not far from me maybe about maybe about 75 to 100 feet from me this thing just appears walks over stomp stomp crash crash it's black okay this thing's black on black so hard to see anything but i can see movement and basically this thing goes to this 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 pond basically starts drinking and didn't stop he drank i mean he must have drank two quarts of water or more i don't know this thing stopped for about 90 seconds drinking water um you know i don't know if it was that long but it was it was at least a minute and so and so you know which i thought really weird so this thing does an appearance okay i can't really see it very well goes over to this pond drinks 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 then from there yeah i hear splash 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 stomp crash stomp stomp crash 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 doing this semicircle around me now i can see him and this thing was definitely bipedaled very athletic this was some frumpy you know pregnant whatever and the um and the thing there is that um is that this thing was doing just a perfect semicircle around me it knew exactly what i was and i finally it looked at me and i just saw the the most incredible icy gray pair of eyes staring right right into my soul and it seemed to say to me i was holding a flashlight a small one in my hand standing there right in front of my tent when this thing was doing this and it seemed to say to me don't even think about it like in other words don't even put that flashlight on me there pal you know i'm gonna be the plague of your life um you know and so i didn't turn my flashlight on i just stood there you know, watching him and doing this semicircle around my camp. And once he was out of sight, he was gone. And that was it. Now, did you see him drinking water? Or did you hear him at that point? Um, well, I saw him. Yeah. Cause, because, because now he was in a little more, um, where the moon still hadn't come up yet, but he was in a little lighter of a situation than when he was back where the pond was. And it was just in a darker corner of the, of the amphitheater. And I'm, I'm kind of curious when you saw him drinking water, did it get down on all fours? Was it drinking water? Yes. Oh, it was yes. all fours. I gotcha. And so, yeah, I, but I could see this mis, misshapen figure over there doing something, you know, um, yeah, yeah, it wasn't something I was going to run over and say, "Hey, who are you?" <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. Now, when he and when he came out and he looked at you, was it kind of more of an outline that you're looking at? You mentioned the eyes. Uh, which... Yes, it was an outline. Um, I could get you know roughly what the height was. He was definitely bigger than me, you know. But he wasn't. It's funny because like I see a lot of these pictures where these, you know, it's like the Sasquatch has these big upper shoulders and you know big buff. You know, this guy was thin, wiry. Uh, wrong um it looked like the kind of thing that um two things of note number one that this thing i mean if i were to throw a deer out in front of him i mean he could run this thing down in 10 seconds flat um i mean he'd easily be able to to down a deer easily and then the other thing too was that my immediate instinct was that i'm looking or i'm witnessing something that is not from this planet and I'm kind of curious, uh, what made you, I mean, what was kind of your feeling about Sasquatch or Bigfoot, however people want to title it, prior mm -hmm. to this encounter, what was kind of your feelings towards? Um, you know, it's funny because in a way it, it goes into the archetype because, you know, when I was driving up there and when I was doing this, I kept thinking in my head, wow, wouldn't it be incredible to see one of these things and I'm, um, or, you know, witness one or, you know, whatever. I, I didn't know what to what to wrap my head around because I didn't understand the lore behind it. And so at that time, however, I did stop at a, this was like, it was, it was just a few days before the hike. And I stopped at this little hamlet where there was a fishing guide. And this was like the patriarch of the fishing guide service, you know, that had been there for the last 60 years or whatever. There was an interesting exchange I was having with him. We were talking about forests and fire and, you know, fishing, all this sort of stuff. 
And I said, yeah, I'm going to go hiking up on those ridge lines, you know, like this. I, I kind of pointed in a, in a rough way. And, and, um, and he grabbed my arm and he said, you be careful up there, boy, you know, that, that there's, that there's spirits up there and they will do bad things to you, you know, dun, 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 dun. and so, and I, yeah, I touch on this little encounter in the book with this fellow. Um, but it was just, it, it really held me because he was so stern and he was so serious about it. Like, you know, um, yeah, you're going to put your life in your hands. You going up there and doing what you're going to do. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, I hear you. I, what, the other question I have for you, uh, be, and uh, the lore aside, when you witness mm -hmm. this creature, what, what kind of gave you that feeling like you're looking at something that isn't from this oh. planet? What, what kind of gave you that impression? I wonder if, if part of it was just this aberrant, you know, um, that we grew up, we know that there's reptiles, amphibians, you know, mammals, you know, um, uh, mountain lions, bears, you know, you know, things like this. All of a sudden, you've got this thing walking and it's just you know that that on its face is going to scare the hell out of you because you know it's not human and yet it's walking and you know and so and so this is this is what you know it 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 can feel like it's just aberrant but then from there it also feels other otherworldly you know and especially where i was cuz i was about oh, i don't know i was like 7 or 8 miles from the nearest road and um by myself yeah, and, and I can understand why you'd feel that way. I mean, you see something that really shouldn't exist, uh, yet right. yet they do. So I, I get completely, and I'm just curious on on what made you feel that way. Um, you know, the other question I want to ask you uh, before mm -hmm. we get into, I know you kind of went on this journey of, of trying to find answers with some of the Native American lore and everything. And mm -hmm. I would imagine, and correct me if my assumption's wrong, but you went out there and you had mentioned a near death experience. Was it just just to kind of clear your mind? To, is that why you're going out? To, um... Yeah, and to change. You know, I mean, I felt like I was I was that I was metamorphosing or I was changing um, and wanting to do something different besides you know risk my naked life on fishing boats that were already doing bad things to the ocean ecosystems and so forth like this. And you know, this is my environmental conscious consciousness coming to surface um but it was a it was just something that i felt like change was afoot and one good way to do that is is you go walking on the ridges yeah i hear you i mean a lot of people do that you know i i did that after uh i had a death in the family you know it's you kind of right. go out to the forest for i guess some to find peace i don't know for lack mm -hmm. of a better word um, you know, one question I want to ask you, cause it, it, it's kind of driving me nuts. The whole fishing boat thing, what, what happened? I mean, you said it was near death. Do you mind br oh, right. briefly telling us what happened on that oh, boat? Yeah. It was just, we were in a, we were in a stormy night and we were fishing in a bad place. It was called the Unimac pass, which separates, uh, the mainland of Alaska with the, with the peninsula, um, you know, going out on the peninsula all the way out to Attu or Dutch Harbor or wherever. Um, so yeah, there's this, there's this pass there and we were fishing in this thing and it was just a dark stormy night. And, you know, my, kind of the difficulty of this is that, is that I have friends that still work up there. And so they're on these factory trawlers. I mean, they've been doing this stuff since I left there in the mid nineties. And, you know, the thing is that probably once a year, they probably, oh, yeah, remember that bad experience back in July, you know, whenever, October, whatever. Um, you know, and so <laughs> so here I here I have this experience on the boat. And to them, it might have been, well, that was kind of severe, but huh, wait till next year, you know. Um, but to me, it was like, oh, my God, this is it. You know, this boat's going to go. Um, I thought the whole enchilada was going to flip. And instead, it, it rewrited itself. But a lot of that was just the fast action from the crew getting the water out of the boat from the factory where we took in a bunch of water. And see, they have these masticator pumps. So they're like these grinding pumps. They'll grind up fish and, you know, organic matter. But if a knife or something like that goes into those pumps, they can freeze them up. And then what happens is you can't get the water out. And all it takes is for the boat to roll a little bit. And that mass of water goes to one side. And that's what that's what creates the boat to flip. How those guys do that is beyond me. You couldn't pay me enough I, to be on one of those boats. You know what I mean? 
I, you know, it's that old month after month of unending boredom coupled with 45 minutes of sheer terror. Um, you know, and that's police and, you know, everybody deals with the Coast Guard. I mean, everybody. But, you know, the thing the thing that happened there was, was that, was that so it was this, it was almost sort of a near death or it freaked me out anyways kind of experience. And I wanted to then, you know, sort of backtrack, get, you know, take stock of myself and figure out what I want to do you know, going forward. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I appreciate you, you know, really going into your encounter. You know, a lot of people come on the show, they share their encounters. Now tell me after this encounter, where you got your information from, tell me about, you'd mentioned, you and I had talked about this, kind of the steps you went through. Walk me through that. You know, what, was it a, a certain tribe that you spoke with that kind oh. of? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so on that, I mean, I've always had a, you know, fascination with Native Americans, especially, you know, you know California, Pacific Coast, you know, Oregon, Washington. Um, that's also where I specialize in my map collecting and stuff like that is, you know, germane to that same area. Um, it really piques my interest because I knew that where I was, it was it was it was basically considered like a sacred area. Um, I knew that there was lore behind this. And so from there, it just took the research of digging into not only the primary materials, like the primary source materials that are published, I don't know, like you can go to any number of um, you know, like historical society stores and stuff like this, and they'll have this kind of information. And then from there, you got to go further as far as, you know, learning the doctoring or learning the shamanism, the, you know, the different ways that these, that these, that these shamans, you know, conduct themselves into, you know, going into this, so to speak, spirit world. And, and the main reason why, you know, if I had to really place an emphasis with the Native Americans, is that it's not so much Native Americans, it's that I want to talk to somebody that's, you know, you know, like hominids, people like us, you know, that have been on the ground for a thousand years, you know, and so quickly that narrows it down. You know, and that could apply to, to Ireland, it could apply to Lithuania, you know, anywhere where, you know, I, it's like, it's like, I want to get in touch with and learn more about the people that understand the spirituality in these religions that, that, that mankind held before we had organized religion come in and arguably, you know, co-opt this and say, no, you have to believe in this system or otherwise, you know, you're just believing in the devil. I feel like that's wrong, but I also feel like, you know, there's, there's a reason for that. It's almost like controlling people and many people like that. You know, they like having that religious doctrine where it's laid out, organized, et cetera. Whereas, whereas the, the belief systems and something like, you know, the little people in that were almost like this dark time of barbarism. And this is what, and this is what people believed in. But I find that to be anything but true because of the fact that it wasn't barbaric, that a lot of these, that a lot of these native peoples around the world had this amazing spiritual system that was very effective and, 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 you know, helped their tribe in so many ways. Yeah, and and I find it fascinating. You took that route that you actually went and did the you know kind of researched and looked into this encounter and why you had this encounter. I know you looked into the little people. What did you find out regarding the little people? And do you go into the little people in the book? Yes, I do because I use it. I use it as a um, as as kind of like a marker to show the universality of it. You know that these things are all over the world. That they. Um, that they come in many different forms. Um, and like, and like you pointed out, many of them are malevolent. Um, I think Bigfoot, like up in British Columbia, I mean, I'm sorry if I was Bigfoot in British Columbia, I'd be seven kinds of mad too, just looking at the way they've absolutely decimated their forest lands. And so in that to me, and this is where, you know, maybe I'm going to have a little bit of a departure with a lot of the folks on the Sasquatch thing, because, because at my core, I mean, I believe in my, you know, I believe in an environmental awareness enough to where to have intact ecosystems where these things can 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 not only survive but even possibly thrive, and these things can be any any life form, and so when we go in and do an industrial style of model of, of forest management or something like that, I mean, you tell me what self respecting Sasquatch is going to like that because it ruins their food chain. You know, right. it ruins. 
you know, it takes away so many things from the natural, that natural system. And, um, and that's what creates imbalance. And that's what creates, you know, I mean, we're seeing the fallout in the form of drought, fires, and, you know, increased heat waves, et cetera. You know, the, the thing there is that I feel like these things are at their core, especially with the little people, that, that they're an environmental creature through and through. Um, you, do you think the little people are more of a, so you don't think it's more of a spiritual, like a spirit that you're running into with the little people? You're saying that you think it's more natural? No, I think I think it's definitely a spiritual thing, and but I just think that they are very, very well attuned to the natural, to the natural world where you know um, where they can. It's almost like I think that's called animism, and the animism is where like everything has a heart and a soul, rocks, trees, everything, and you know when you when you think of the world in that term. You know, it's like it's like when they present themselves, they're already in such great attunement. And all we can try to do is strive to get in that level of attunement. When people read the book, it'll be kind of a family history, your family history, correct? And then as you go into what you your with your experience, it's more of a, uh, loosely based on what happened to you out there. Yes. I guess. Yes. Yeah, and so and then and then in the course of that, you know, with the um, with the native people, I kind of interject some of that into this, um, and so that's why you know it's it's kind of fun as far as magical realism, where you know you're in this realistic world, but then it goes into the magical. I got you. I got you. So, what do you think that Sasquatch is? I know you you said that you didn't think it was from this planet, but I mean, what what do you? If someone were to ask you, Greg, what is Sasquatch? What would you say? <laughs> I would say that what we're dealing with. I mean, and this is just from my extensive research, reading, watching, watching the amazing shows like yours with the Sasquatch Chronicles. Um, I would have to say that what we're working with is either. It's either like a physical bipedal anthropoid that has the ability to um, to basically step in and out of our world, and that could be done like the his coat, you know, his hair. Um, it might have a frequency or something like this that can that can make it they can make it sort of disappear, even though he's right in front of us. I mean, there's different thoughts to this. Are we dealing with, you know, are we dealing with anthropoids that are here 24 seven that live somewhere, you know, like this, are we dealing with something that's interdimensional where, yeah, it's, it's in our plane of existence, but it's not here on our existence at all times. Or are we dealing with something that comes from, from an exoplanet and somehow, you know, can makes its way here through a traversable wormhole. You know, the wormhole thing is fun and it's, and it sure sure is delightful for for a lot of astrophysicists, but also a lot of the top astrophysicists don't believe in wormholes. <laughs> and so, yeah. So it's a so it's a slippery one, you know. But but I think that I don't think that we're dealing with something that's here twenty four seven. And I base that on uh, many of my friends are wildlife biologists, stream surveyors. They're out there at all hours of the night and day. They like me. We just feel like we would have more evidence given the amount of people out there on public lands, you know, that, that are having these encounters that, you know, we'd have a skeleton, we'd have, you know, there'd be something in the fossil record. There'd be, you know, there'd be more evidence to this thing. Um, but when you get into the semi woo, you know, into the, into the dimensional theory and stuff like that, now this makes sense because now this thing can appear and disappear. And so it doesn't make any difference if there's seven feet of snow on the ground or the place is going up in flames and, and summer fires, he's not there. And I find that fascinating. And I've often wondered exactly what you were saying because uh, you know, they're, they're all over the world. I mean, Sasquatch is seen in, you know, right. in China, it's in Australia, it's in Russia, almost on every continent, they have a, a name for these things. And yet nobody can quite catch up with them. Um, the interdimensional right. thing, you know, that that's kind of a new term, I think, that that people start to use. Um, you know, like uh, you and I, Greg, back back in the day, we'd probably call those ghosts or demons or, you right. know, uh, but it's strange that this creature seems to show up and, I mean, no one can catch up with it. There's a lot of bizarre stories of lights and 
They seem to have a weird language, but yet, like you saw the footprints, they'll leave trace evidence behind. It's hard to, for me to wrap my head around the interdimensional thing, because uh, I think of, when I think of that, and maybe it's the religious or the ex-religious side of me talking, mm. you know, I think of demons, I think of ghosts, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, but it's weird to have a creature that seems to show up and disappear too as well, just as quick. Um, right. And you're right. I mean, for something that, you know, on average, most people say is between seven to 10 feet tall and a thousand pounds or more. And and we can't catch up with it. It's, it's hard to wrap your head around that. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what I got hung up with too. And that's, I mean, like, you know, a colleague, a friend of mine that was on our board with the Crater Lake uh, a Natural History Association, she found a, um, or was one of her grad students. And this was up near Crater Lake, Rogue River National Forest. It was a creek there. And there was a log in the creek. And on that log, on the bottom side of it in the creek, like underwater, were these mushrooms growing. And they were able to find a new species of mushroom. Now, mushrooms can't run, you know, so they have to stay in one place. But I guess what I'm trying to say there is, is that we've got these, we've got people out there on the ground finding this, these esoteric things that, you know, would be normally difficult to find, you know, and yet here we have this, this eight foot anthropoid, you know, running around, um, you know, and no evidence. So, yeah, there is some evidence, but I, I tend to agree with you that there should be more um, yeah, yeah, or very little, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, even some of these other weird cryptids people are seeing, like the Dogman, all these cryptids, they seem to sh- be showing up, and people seem to be seeing them more and more. It makes me wonder why. Yeah, and it could be that the cryptids, I mean, if, you know, I mean, if you, you know, if you want to get weird with this, you know, that, that basically it's like our natural world is going through some crashes. And, you know, how would the the cryptid world respond to that? You know, so you're stepping into this this odd sort of spirituality, and and then from there with 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 either environmental destruction and, and or environmental degradation, one or the other, that has led to to habitat loss, that has led to you know these things, that you know does it and how does it affect them and you know what do they do what do they think of us you know. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a sticky one, you know, because you're dealing with spirituality and belief, you know? So, yeah, know. it is. And it's like, I always say to people, you know, I'll ask, I ask everyone, you know, what do you think Sasquatch is? And there's right. no wrong answer because no one really knows, you know, no one right. has one in their garage that they're studying and it is right. a fun mystery and it is yeah. life changing when you run into one, just like you did, Greg, you know, it is, it is, it, it will absolutely freak you out. Um, you know, then exhilarate you and, you know, um, you know, because I mean, number one, you're in a situation now where you don't have control. This thing could kill you, you know, I mean, you don't know. And, um, and so, so yeah, that's what, but you know, you got to wonder that that's what people are so fascinated with, that it's that mystique, the adventure, the, you know, um, to have something out there that's a mystery, it's almost necessary. I mean, I would say it's delightful, but it's almost necessary. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree with you, Greg. I, I think it's fun to have a mystery. I think without a mystery, life would be boring. Uh, but I think we as humans, we want to solve a mystery. It drives us crazy. At least it does me. And hopefully one day we'll solve this mystery. Uh, but for the audience out there, definitely check out Greg's book, The Ridge Walkers: When Legend Becomes an Encounter. And the book is available at theridgewalkers.com. I will include links. Uh, Greg, thanks so much for coming on. 